So if there's something that I believe we can all agree on is that open source is in the middle of a complex and multifaceted crisis. That was really brought to attention, to, to me at least, um, a couple of years ago by um, Nadia Egbal's uh, work, Roads and Bridges, which talked about the work and the, the sustainability issues behind the, our digital infrastructure. More recently, um, folks like uh, John Mark wrote Why Open Source Failed in Medium and its follow-up, Save Open Source, Save the World. Uh, Mike Overby um, answered John Mark's article um, claiming that uh, corporate abuse was really the source of the problem. There's been a whole careful over uh, cloud companies um, using software and, and taking the value um, of um, the, the work of open source companies. Uh, there's been obviously answers to that from the cloud companies themselves, such as in this article here on keeping open source open by releasing a, an open distribution of Elasticsearch or a fork, depending on who you ask and, and um, what their opinion on the topic is. And more recently, we've also seen the emergence of um, ethical issues and the ethical open source movement. Here, an article by uh, Caroline Etta Emke um, in uh, Model View Culture. And just this summer, Bruce Parents, uh, the uh, inventor of the open source definition and one of the founders of the Open Source Initiative, released this video um, of him um, which was titled, What Comes After Open Source, and really acknowledges some of the failures that the open source movement has had so far. So what's interesting, if we look at all of this, um, all of these different aspects, all of these different facets of this crisis, um, is that they're really centered around um, three main areas. One is the increased cost of maintaining software to individuals. So maintainer burnout, essentially. The second one is um, a, a number of actors in the open source community feeling that cloud infrastructure companies are essentially capturing all of the value of the open source work and that um, the actual companies or the actual individuals creating the software aren't getting um, a fair part of the uh, of the value that they're creating and then the the last current is one that is really concerned about the ethical aspects of um, open source and the impact of software on end users and so this begs the question well what's really going on here and in fact what we're seeing here what we're witnessing is the emergence of new constituencies um, that we have to cater for and take care of. So why is having new constituencies creating a crisis? Why aren't the tools that we have um, today to, to make decisions and choices in the open source community um, adapted to dealing with this new situation? Well, to really understand that, um, what we have to look at is the origin of when the four freedoms and the open source definition were created and sort of what the ecosystem looked like back then compared to what it is today. Let's consider that today, open source and software are ubiquitous. Right? There are more than 4 billion people that have access to internet. There are tens of millions of developers, professional and, and non-professional. And, and software and open source is, is broadly spread across the world. Um, all of this contrasts dearly with what open source and free software look like when the four freedoms and the OSD were defined. Um, we're looking back then at a, a way smaller ecosystem um, and um, 
developers and, and people using computers back then were often referred to, uh, they were either professional developers working for uh, large companies, or they were referred to as hobbyists. There was no really, um, com computing was not really something that would happen in, in sort of like your day to day if you weren't either professionally involved with software or if you were, if that was a hobby of yours, something you were invested in. And in both cases, uh, the, that ecosystem was tiny, uh, North American based, essentially um, uh, Californian to, to a lot of degrees. And there was a huge overlap between the people that were actually using the software and the people that were developing it because the software was so hard to use, so complex, you really needed programming skills to be able to uh, do anything with it. Right. So the four freedoms in the OSD as sort of guiding principles for open source were designed in that context and, and was that environment in mind. Right. Which is very, very different than the one that we have today. And so the question is, well, was that changing context, essentially? Uh, and with the increased diversity of constituencies that we have today, what do we do and how do we handle this? So having to handle a broad set of constituencies and their potentially conflicting opinions and wants and needs around the same topic is nothing new. Lots of organizations in the past have been... Um, faced with that problem and one of the ones that i'm fairly familiar with that i've worked for and, and was for a long time in the web standardization space is w3c and w3c has built a over a decade ago a concept called the priority of constituencies um, and it, it it was actually born in the html working group irc channel on the 27th of march uh, 2007 and the idea was really to write down um, principles that had been in use by the group to make decisions in case of conflict. And so the first um, iteration of this ended up in the design principle, the HTML design principles. Um, and I'm just going to read you uh, the beginning of the priority of constituency so you have an idea of what it actually describes. It says, in case of conflict, consider users over authors. So authors is uh, W3C lingo to describe web developers. Over implementers, who are the engineers in them, the companies actually building the browsers themselves. Over specif specifiers, who are the people writing the specs. Over theoretical purity. So what's interesting here is that we have both a tool that's designed to organize constituencies and, uh, and, and see which one are favored from a, a cost effectiveness uh, perspective. But it's also a tool that really refocuses um, the whole point of building web standards and, and the internet on servicing end users rather than the other constituencies that are there to help create that promise. So if we turn this into sort of an equation, uh, we have this, right? It's end users over authors, over implementers, over spec editors, over theoretical purity. And of course, uh, from a sort of like cost effectiveness perspective, that makes a, a lot of sense because if we look at the size of each constituency, we have end users are in the billions, right? There are millions of developers, um, something around 20 to 40 million, depending on who you ask, uh, and it's moving quickly. Implementers are the engineers and the, the, the PMs and all the people working for um, browser vendors. And so they're in the thousands. And spec editors are probably in the tens to the hundreds, depending on who exactly you include in that group. And then, of course, you have theoretical purity, which doesn't really, is not really in, in the same, operating in the same space. Um, and so another way of looking at that is sort of like, you know, imagining the cost of one hour of work. If a spec editor says, well, I don't really want to spend an hour of work to like clarify this problem, that's probably going to cost hundreds of hours at the implementer level to 
um, of, of bugginess, of like bug fixing, of lack of clarity, of misunderstandings, of reading the specs, etc. Um, and those bugs are probably going to cost like millions of hours at the um, web developer level. And, you know, this is going to have an impact of billions of hours at the end user, right? Because every time you're sort of like increasing a thousand fold, basically, sort of, between the, those different levels, which is why you really want to make sure that you move everything um, towards uh, upstream as possible because that's uh, much more cost effective and is much better for, for end users. And, and that should be the goal of, of software in general. Um, what's interesting is if, if you look at this um, formula again and you focus on the end user bit and the theoretical purity bit, right? And you sort of like bring them together this reminds me a lot of the Apache Software Foundation mantra of people over code. Right? So, and you know, and, and these two different organizations solving sort of like different problems. And of course, the people over code of um, the Apache Software Foundation is really about the community around the, the, um, the open source project. And so, so not necessarily the broader constituencies yet. But it, you know, it has the same notion of people over code um, that we that we see in the W3C's um, priority of constituencies, which is really end users over theoretical purity. So, what would an open source priority of constituencies look like? Well, in order to find that out, what we have to do is list all of the constituencies of open source today. So beyond just the developer and the user of a piece of software and see how we could organize them in a way similar um, to how W3C has organized their own constituents. So who do we have in open source? Well, we have, of course, maintainers, which can be individuals or corporations. We have contributors, which also can be both individuals and corporations. We have the cloud infrastructure. We have application developers, which are using open source to produce closed source software or using open source to produce more open source software. And then, of course, we have end users of the software that's produced that way. And we have people that are impacted by the software, but not even using it. For example, consider um, someone that is walking down the street and who is uh, being um, uh, filmed and who um, who is being recognized by um, a, a facial recognition using software that's being created by someone somewhere right so not even aware that they're being that they're are using software right now but still subject to it so if we sort of organize, all of these different constituencies um, in a similar structure, um, focusing strictly on how, how costly it, it is to implement a solution or a feature at every level, um, this is what we get, right? So we get people over end users, over app developers, over cloud infrastructure, over contributors, over maintainers, over theoretical purity. And I'm sure you will be quick to point out that uh, maintainers and contributors are already overworked and burning out. How come they are above or, or below in the considerations, if, if you will, uh, to cloud infrastructure? Well, from a cost effectiveness perspective, that makes sense, right? Because Fixing something in the upstream project that, you know, at the maintainer level, if you will, is way more effective than having every cloud infrastructure implement that change themselves and maintain a fork, etc. So, so that, that's the reasoning behind this. But you're right to point out that this is a problem um, and we'll get to it immediately. But to answer this, we'll go back to see if W3C's priority of constituencies is actually a silver bullet, a bullet for W3C itself. 
To answer this, we have to consider the economic situation of the different constituencies. Let's look at this. Obviously, end users are individuals um, with varying financial means, but generally, uh, compared to um, large implementers, are really in, on the low end of the uh, sort of fi financial uh, ability. Authors can be um, a, a single person publishing content on the web, uh, all the way to multi-billion dollar corporations like Facebook. So obviously, um, how, how well off they are in their economic situation um, is, is extremely broad, like the fork is extremely broad. But generally, they're, we can consider them better off in, in a more stable economic situation than end users. Of course, uh, implementers, uh, although there are smaller um, um, you know, browser vendors, um, among the, the biggest browser vendors, um, Apple and Google, and to some degree Microsoft, are also some of the largest companies in the world. Now, spec editors oftentimes uh, work for implementers, but that's not always the case. And it's actually extremely valuable to get the perspective of um, uh, spec editors who are not working for large corporations and who can drive um, what end users care about or even what uh, developers and authors care about in, in a more, uh, was more sort of personal experience in them. And it turns out that that's when, when that's the case, uh, as you can see, there, there's something sort of, if you focus on the implementer to spec editor, editor space, um, well, we had this nice progression of um, in, increase, uh, an increasingly better economic situation as we moved upstream uh, and had to do more work. We have this like weird uh, tension, a weird drop right here, right? And, and this, of course, is um, highly problematic because it tends to push spec editors who are operating in that space was, on one hand, the, the will to do good and sort of the pressure to fulfill this priority of constituencies and really take on the work at the spec editor level um, to uh, make sure that uh, the, the, the work doesn't need to be done multiple times downstream. Um, but of course, that ends up being extremely costly for um, spec editors in, in just in terms of like financial um, situation and sometimes even in terms of, of mental health um, generated from sort of like the stress of having to handle the situation and doing that was uh, extremely little financial means to do so. So uh, one of the solutions that um, have been that has started um, to to take place is to have sort of implementers via W3C start helping um, fund um, uh, spec editors or what we also called uh, invited experts. So, so people that come um, that are not working for uh, companies that are sort of independent and that are participating in the standards uh, bodies. Um, and so, yeah, this is an article I wrote last year on the topic saying that W3C really wasn't doing enough to help its invited experts. Um, so it, the, the people writing um, the standards. And I'm sure that the, this whole tension of having people uh, feel a lot of guilt um, that they have to be working on something and, and not being really paid for it um, and feeling like they have to um, rings about. Right? This is the parallel here uh, was the, the feeling of maintainers is uh, very explicit. If we go back to our open source priority of constituencies, and we do what we did for the W3C one, which is to look at the financial situation of every constituencies. Well, uh, you know, we, we see the same increase of 
financial buying power or whatever you want to call it as you move from people to end users to app developers to cloud infrastructure, right? And then at the contributors and maintainers level, so I, I've split it up here between individuals and um, corporations to make it more clear, right? So uh, individuals are not making a lot of money, obviously, and not don't have a, a really high uh, financial uh, um, situation, and corporations are usually better off, right? We sort of see emerge the same kind of issue here that we had in um, W3 in W3C, right? Which is concentration of um, money uh, somewhere in the middle of this cons uh, priority of constituencies, or at least in a place that is not coherent with the necessity of having to do more work um, than um, constituencies that are before in the priority. So again, here, um, you know, the solution that we've seen so far is to is to see app developers and cloud infra start funding open source, right? And this is exactly what is happening to some degree through uh, foundations, for example, where uh, large companies are sponsoring foundations, which are then creating sort of like small travel funds and, and that kind of, of solution, right? So obviously, um, you know, this is just one option of the solution to this uh, particular problem. But what I find interesting here is that um, this uh, priority of constituencies not only sort of like organizes the work in a logical way, but also underline, like makes it super obvious to see where there are going to have points of frictions in the future and um, in advance, right? Imagine now that we want to add sort of like community managers of, of, of software, of open source software projects uh, in this mix uh, and to put those in, in the priority of constituencies. So they probably belong somewhere between contributors and maintainers, I would suggest, or between cloud infra and contributors. Either way, uh, we can see right away that these are going to be uh, people who are, don't have the mean, the financial situation and the means of cloud infrastructure, and yet are going to be responsible for a lot more work um, and uh, will have a lot more responsibility and, and accountability than people lower down the, the, the list, right? People who are pri more prioritized, if you want. And as a result, we can already see that this is going to be problematic. And I'm sure if, if we just ask people in the room right now, if we're like physically in the same room, it would be fairly obvious that th the same kind of um, issues of, around burnout that we see from maintainers probably show up with community managers that are not funded directly by a large corporations, a large corporation, just the same. So in conclusion, what I really find valuable and interesting about a priority of constituency is that it keeps us focused on people and downstream impact. What I do as an engineer, as a maintainer, as a contributor, as an application developer, as a cloud infrastructure provider, impacts people. And a priority of constituencies reminds us all the time about this. I think that's really important. And that is really close to the, again, the Apache Software Foundation, people of a code um, guiding principle. Um, the second really interesting point of operative constituency is it maximizes the benefits to the commons by upstreaming work. And then lastly, which is the point I was just making earlier, it, such a priority of constituency surfaces the discrepancies between the economic situation of individual of individual actors or actors in, in this um, in, in this um, framework and their work expectations, right? So, because you want to maximize benefits to the commons by moving everything upstream, you have to make sure that you also fund upstream actors so that you don't get huge discrepancies and all of the burnout issues that we were talking about and that we've seen affect people in our community.
don't know if we have uh, questions in the in the share notes, but we don't. Um, Yeah, did you see the nice touch? <laughs> Someone is saying I'm wearing the same clothes. So yes, I am wearing the same clothes. And I did that on purpose because I saw someone in one of the earlier talks drink the same drink. So I thought I was going to up that. And I just had the time to do so. <laughs> so a question from Jacob that says, how do we fund manage the back and forth of upstreaming work? Yeah, that's, that, that's a really good question. Um, I think a priority of constituency is actually just underlines, I mean, shows the problem, surfaces the problem. I, I don't think it has, uh, it provides answers to this. Um, and like, it, it would be very presumptuous of, of myself to try and answer this in um, two minutes right now. Also, I really haven't, I mean, it, this is a really hard, difficult topic. <laughs> so someone else is uh, talking about wearing the same t-shirt. Thank you. Oh, there's a question here. Uh, uh, in, uh, assuming you have community agreement on a YRG, how do you get OSI or anyone else to govern according to it? I mean, constituency, constituencies ordering is good, but as we have learned in places, it may just be window dressing if not implemented to make policy decisions. Uh, thank you, Jamie, for the question. That's, uh, I think that's a really good question. Um, I, I think really my aim here was more to just suggest that the, there were interesting tools that other communities were using to solve similar problems, or at least problems that I find similar to the ones that we're facing uh, today in open source, and that we should consider those. Um, like from an implementation perspective, how exactly do we implement this and how exactly do we get different actors in the field um, to to uh, adopt those I, I i don't i don't have good answers to that yet um georg asks how would i start to create a priority of constituencies in my own community or is that the wrong approach um that's a good question um i think that the the way w3c's constituency is extremely powerful is that it's it's fairly simple and it's used across the whole um, web standardization community. So my inclination would be to have one for open source, um, or maybe to have one for a few types of different open source projects. Maybe like we have a contributor covenant. Um, so you know, have like some basic. Uh, sort of template that you can then adapt a bit to like the specificity of, of your particular community. But because of how they all have to sort of fit in this broader ecosystem, which is essentially like the world, right? Um, it, it has to sort of have a, um, uh, it has to all come from sort of like a similar template. That that would be my my initial feeling about this. Maybe that's not that's not practical. Thank you so much, Toby, for your presentation. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody.